But this is a way for, you know, we thought that you could get to know another side of, of your fellow attendees. So I hope, you know, if we, if we do get through this and everybody likes it, that in future years, you know, everybody will participate. But the idea is to have a five minute presentation, you know, a la TED Talks, but shorter, um, from presenters that you know and some presenters that you haven't met yet. Um, on a personal aspect of their life, or some anecdote, or some, you know, experience that has nothing to do with Warsaw. Okay, so you get to know another side of them. So, with that, you know, we really have to get through these. We're going to have a limited amount of time. So our first presenter is Chris Freer. I'll turn it over to Chris. And we'll go from there. Good morning, everyone. It's always fun to go first on something like this. We'll get it going. So, for those of you that don't know me and don't know this part of my life, uh, about five years ago, while coming home from work, I found myself sitting in a place where all of us spend way too much time, not the first thing you're thinking, in traffic. So I was sitting in traffic and I was looking around me and I noticed something, that no one in the other cars was smiling. Not the right place to smile, right? Now, I thought about it, and I'm like, you know, I spend way too much time in traffic. I had what we might consider the, the successful life. I had it all, it seemed, you know, beautiful home, beautiful wife, great job, great car, all that stuff. But there was still something missing. Meanwhile, I have these friends, they're going off and going to different parts of the world, doing different volunteer work, doing missionary work. They had nothing, their lives were completely simple, they had nothing, made nothing, and were probably the happiest people that I know. I so said, you know what, they know something, they have a secret. There's something that they're doing that's different. So my wife and I talked about it. We had the goal of moving to another country and to doing some volunteer work, but we went ahead and decided to put the plan into practice. So we applied to an organization we got an assignment to a small island just off the coast of Panama. It's a Caribbean island, it's called Bocas del Toro. It's just off the north coast. Teeny little island, few cars, mostly bicycles that zip around. Beautiful island, that was our assignment. So we started to sell off our stuff. People thought we were crazy. We emptied our storage unit, we sold our home, sold our car. We were gonna go for a long term. Hardest thing about it was quitting my job, severing the technology thing. I thought if I quit this, I'm never gonna be able to get back into it. I'm gonna go off to this third world country, I'm gonna completely lose touch with where technology is at. That was the most difficult part for me. But we knew we made the right decision when the last thing that we had to do before we left, we reduced all of our earthly possessions down to three bags each. That includes technology stuff, which I know would be a tall order in this room. But we got our stuff all the way down to three bags. That's all we took with us. But our last order of business was to sell our car. We drove it downtown, we found a buyer. They met us at a bank. We transferred over all the legal paperwork and all that stuff. And my wife and I stood out on the, car, stood out on the sidewalk and we watched the man drive off with our car. That was our last thing to go. We officially had nothing, except for a few clothes. So did we arrive? Well, I was completely nervous, scared as heck, right? But we got on our public transportation to go back to where we were staying. We sat down on the bus and a lady looked across us from the other side of the, the bus and she said, hey, excuse me, what's your secret? I said, what, what do you mean? She said, are you guys like starting to date? Or are you, are you newly, newly married? What's your secret? You look so happy. So well, we are. I said, but it's interesting. It, she says, well, why? Why are you so happy? What is it that's unique about today? I said, well, well, I'm, I'm homeless. <laughs> <laughs> I'm carless. I'm jobless. And it's amazing. And she says, well, I'm all of those three things too, and I'm not happy. <laughs> So we went to Panama, and then we discovered, <clears throat> when people were asking us what was it like to come down, we discovered that very quickly my wife and I coined a phrase, FWPs, for <coughs> little problems. 
See, we were bogged down by first world problems. It was interesting. We, I saw the one. I got one minute left. <laughs> so uh, when we were describing to the people down there, they asked us, well, what was it like to sell off your stuff? By the way, we still live there. We did move, move just to a small town in Costa Rica. But the hardest thing to describe to them about our former life was a storage unit. I said, yeah, you rent a place where you put stuff, and then you rent it. And the locals there, the indigenous people were like, wait, 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 so you pay three times what we pay in rent for a storage space where you put crap <laughs> that you're not gonna use. They didn't get it. And that's when I said, you know, there's some funny things we do. <laughs> Just some food for thought. The next time you're in traffic, thank you. My prime minister. Learn 
They dialed 88 new mic, new mic, um, sorry, new mic, new mic for study. <laughs> Many protection in those days. In Japan, there is a round speed protection. Uh, some floppy disk controller can change round speed of floppy disk controller. Do you know someone? So, <laughs> in those days, we use this 5 inch disk. So, someone find big cut papers by scissors and screw into floppy disk. Then, loading. We can copy this. <laughs> 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 and communication is found. Uh, my father bought me a new computer, X1 Turbo. X1 Turbo is very high speed and fast computer. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the communication systems. And I also do amateur radio. Uh, Juliet Alpha 1 Uniform Victor Goro is my uh, call. Man, call. Uh, this precious call because they won. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, growing up uh, in university, uh, I started Windows 95, <coughs> and I am a gamer, and i all that, that history. <laughs> uh, and motorcycle now, motorcycle. <laughs> To talk about, I'm going to start at the end and go to the beginning, and then I'll go from the beginning back to the end. It's kind of going to help uh, maximize the learning. So, beer is really just a process of taking sugar and then adding some yeast to it. The yeast consumes sugar, produces alcohol and carbon dioxide. Where do we get the sugar from? It comes from malts and grains. Um, so, that's very quickly and backwards. Uh, in Germany, I know we got some German people out here. If I say anything wrong, please just tell me afterwards because I only got a few minutes. In Germany, if you want to call something beer, it has to have four and only four ingredients. Malted barley, water, hops, and yeast. And that the process is grains have starch that lasts for a long time so that they can survive the seasons, etc. And as soon as they uh, start to sprout, it, it's the process called malting. It's all of the starches in the grain converts to sugar so that these little seedlings have a chance to grow. They get the nutrition before they can actually grow roots and, and leaves to do all the, the scientific stuff. So that's malted. And then they take those grains, they, they dry them, and, and that's uh, the, the malted barley that is used for beer. To extract the sugar from it, it has to be in water. And there's some very specific temperatures. So at between 150 and 160 degrees, the sugar is properly extract from, from the malted barley. If you go hotter than that, then you get weird types of sugars, and it releases tannins, becomes bitter, and it's nasty. Uh, about 150 degrees, perfect. You get from that what's called malt extract. You boil the malt extract, you add hops to it. Boiling is important. The malt extract, it's got all the sugar that you need. You boil it in order to release the, uh, the ABUs, the bitterness from the hops. That adds, that offsets the, the sweetness, otherwise it's just like drinking a bowl of honey. Uh, so you add the hops, boil it for a little while, and uh, in the end, you just you have a, a, a wart, is what it's called. Uh, it's ready to be beer, but it's not beer yet. You pitch the yeast in, put it off in a closet for a week or so, what comes out on the other end is beer. Uh, it's homegrown beer, it's delicious, can't get any fresher than that. And you get a lot of enjoyment, because it's something you created. And when I do it, it's something I created. It's part of the, the joy and pleasure of home brewing is knowing that it's something you've done on your own. Uh, and then, in a nutshell, that's the science part of it. So now let's talk about the art. What are some of the different things that you can do to make these beers your own? You know, when I started, it was, uh, you know, follow the recipe card exactly, because I was afraid I was going to screw it up and have something that was uh, undrinkable. After I did that a few times, I decided to, to try and experiment. Hey, what happens if, uh, if I change up the grain bill? Instead of only using malted barley, I want to add some, some roasted barley. Give it a little bit more body, 
a little bit darker color. Made a, a really good Irish stout that way. Um, you can also change up the amounts of hops. So instead of using all, uh, you know, Cascade hops, there's, there's more varieties of hops than I can, than I can speak to. But instead of using this variety, I'm gonna change it over to that one. Instead of adding them at the 60 minute mark and boiling them for the full hour, I'm gonna add some at the end and let those, you won't really get the bitterness. It doesn't taste different, but it adds a lot of body and, and head, aroma to your beer. Uh, you can add adjuncts. So I made a, uh, an apple beer. I threw green apples in uh, and mixed those up. I made a peach beer. Uh, switched over to some Belgian styles where you use wheat instead of, of barley. And uh, lots of lots of art. It's really, I'm still learning. The science is uh, self-explanatory. It's, it's, we're all uh, intelligent people. We like the science. But it's the art of being able to take a, a craft beer from a recipe, change it up, and make it your own. And I, I talked a lot faster than I expected, so that's all I have. I will gladly take questions afterwards. Okay, good morning, guys. Uh, my name is John Brosnan. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Netfort Technologies. We're based in Galway, on the west coast of Ireland. So myself and two engineers started up Netfort 10 years ago. And just over the next few minutes, I'd like to go through some of the hard lessons we've learned. So I'm a graduate of University of Limerick. I did electronics, graduated in 86, and joined digital equipment, DEC. I spent 10 years with DEC in high performance computing division. Worked with them in Reading and over in Nashville, New Hampshire. I was really lucky to get a job with Dick because they invested hugely in the people. And uh, looking back on it, I really needed that investment. Uh, they also had some very good engineers to work with and the mentoring that I got there was fantastic. So after 10 years of Dick, I joined another VC, a VC-based startup who were doing a two gig VPN firewall. And I was writing twice to hours and you all ever told me for them. Spent six years there with them. Working in the VC company is very interesting. So lesson one, we did, two of us, three of us got together and decided we wanted to do a startup. So lesson number one is who do you want to do a startup with? So just look back at the engineers you've worked with. And that's a really good way of getting to know somebody. We spend lots of time with them. And the guys that we really are smart, energetic, the guys that are not nine to five, the guys put in the hours when it's needed, and the guys who care, they are the guys you want to do a startup with. So I had two very good friends that I started up the company. So we decided to bootstrap. So we decided we knew we could write software, but we didn't know we could sell. We never had a software customer while we were tech. So we decided if we couldn't sell in our own backyard in Ireland, there was no point. So we developed a product as quickly as we could in our own network visibility space, and we started selling it locally and testing it locally with the people, the friendly people, and it was a great way to do it. And then we moved to the UK, the next biggest market, and we got some sales. So after three years, we, got, we had some sales now in the UK, and we got an offer, our first offer of VC funding. And it was really, really tempting to take the money, because we had to sell to survive, and we were paying ourselves very little. So, but we knew we needed a different shack. We needed a guy with business and financial sense in the company. So we spoke to a few people. We didn't really know anybody. And we took some money on board and gave them some equity. So lesson number two, even in a startup, spend as much money as you can on good legal advice as we then the start. So fast forward, we took some money on board, private money, and we started selling in the UK and Europe and the US. So this is what the company was eight years on the go, and then last year, somebody came on board and offered us a big bunch of money to invest in the company. And a lot of people, including myself, were very excited. But unfortunately, one of the sharks we took on board got greedy. And we just signed the deal with the guy, but he said, I'm not happy with this deal. If you don't give me more, I'll do everything in my power to stop the going through. So after six weeks of negotiation and some stuff, he backed down and went back to the original deal. And it was, it was a very stressful time going through all that, and maybe we should have dealt with it a bit better. But. So the final lesson for me was that 
you know, people offer from investment. It's very easy to take the cash, but be careful about the people you take investment from, because you're going to be dealing with these people a long time. And final lesson, the people you take on board that you didn't really know, and you give equity, and you put in a senior position in the company, also be very careful. I have a simple test now, I have looking back on it, and it comes back to something Joe was saying. If there's somebody that you don't want to hang out with, that you don't feel like going for a beer with, then the answer is probably no. Thank you very much. Chris was going to do his thing about the, the volunteer stuff. <laughs> so this is, uh, uh, well, a little bit like, a little bit not like. Uh, when I was young, um, quite young, I was in the Peace Corps. And it's, it, in a lot of ways, it's just like what they say it is. You know, the toughest job you'll ever love. Um, I was living in a small town at the edge of the bush um, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, you know, they pretty much drop you off with a book that says, Where There Is No Doctor. And there you are for two, <laughs> there you are for two years. Um, I taught English as a foreign language, um, and my classes had um, 70 kids in most of them. Um, you can go right down the road, and, you know, it's quite a bit to control kids, that many kids, <laughs> all at once. Um, but anyway, um, it, was, it was an incredible learning experience. It was two of the happiest years of my life, um, but I saw a lot. You know, I learned about what it's like not to have water, um, what it's like when kids die of preventable diseases, um, what small, you know, vaccinations. Most of the kids couldn't get vaccinations. I had kids in my class who had um, leprosy, elephantitis, and polio. And so, when, you know, when I hear some of the moms not wanting to immunize their kids, you know, I can't even believe it. Um, it, was, it anyway, it was, I, I, learned an, <laughs> I learned an awful lot. And the other thing I learned too is like, it, you know, there's darkness in a lot of places. You know, at, um, there's, no, there's no people, there's no places that are really better than any other places. You know, there's jealousy and backbiting and violence and lack of freedom of speech in over there. Just like we have greed, materialism, and all kinds of other stuff here. So no place is, you know, you can be happy anywhere. There's darkness everywhere. You know, having said that, at the end, very end, they, in, they said, she's not a stranger, she's not a foreigner, she's one of us, which is something I was really, really proud of. Um, Fast forward quite a few years, and um, now I'm working um, close to Silicon Valley, second startup, and I, I'm seeing lots of technology that's available for the developing world. And so I talked to the Peace Corps director, and, and I said, well, what, what if we can combine, like get Silicon Valley and Peace Corps talking together? Um, and so, you know, we can have a database, we can have people who know how to do stuff for the developing world, and have Peace Corps volunteers implement it. And it sounds like a really good idea, it's really hard to do, and I don't know if it's gonna work at all. There's a lot, I mean, we've been talking, we've been doing stuff, there's a lot of arrogance on both sides of the border here. Engineers talking about like, well, of course, all you do is a delay tolerant uh, network, and you know, here's these specs which a doctoral student wrote. Of course, you can do that in probably ten minutes. <laughs> and and the Peace Corps volunteers are saying, you don't get it. Somebody gonna steal that thing before you turn your head. <laughs> and so, as I say, it's a very very interesting project. Um, the jury's still out on whether any of it will work. But I will say this, the Peace Corps and the world has changed very, very much. Um, I was in Tanzania the other day, standing in front of a, um, a Maasai warrior's hut, you know, full um, guard, the mud hut, grandma, cell phone 
in the other hand. Yeah, so, so the world has changed, and the internet really is the basis for a lot of things. Whether we can, any of us, what, I mean, I don't know, I think, as I say, I'd like to make it work somehow, but I don't know if we will. So thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Kevin Burns. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying that from the earliest time in my life, I remember always being interested in everything. Uh, I think at 10 years old, I had an electronic set. Uh, I was uh, playing soccer, I played baseball, I swam. Uh, as I got older, uh, I got my scuba diving certification. Uh, I was into like backpacking as I even got Older, I picked up uh, canyoneering, rappelling into canyons, exploring those things. Uh, I'm actually an active member uh, in the Bigfoot field researchers community. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, like to, I, just, I like to know things. I never quite understood why. I just feel like it's just me. Like I always just go, oh, there's information. I'd watch a, a TV show about something, and I'd say, oh, I gotta go Google that or find out more about it. And uh, Interesting, because I, I always uh, thought this maybe this was just compensating for growing up with attention deficit disorder. Um, I was like, well, maybe I'm just trying to relearn all this stuff and compensate for those insecurities when I was a kid. Um, so I never really quite understood, you know, what, what makes me tick. Uh, you know, and several years ago, there was a, a, a girl I was you know, dating, and she's like, you know, you're always all over the place. You know, you got all these books and all these different topics and UFOs and computers and Bigfoot and. Well, she didn't really sound, well, yeah, she did sound like, she did kind of say it like that. Um, so, you know, I was like, oh, what, you know, what's wrong with me? Well, well, is there something wrong with me? You know, I never you know, quite understood, you know, what, what was my problem? Um, and uh, who's seen the movie Step Brothers? Step Brothers? Remember the part where the father is, is trying to teach, tell the kids that Catalina Wine Mixer, you know, is like, don't lose your dreams. He's like, don't deny who you are. Like, don't, don't forget your dinosaur. You know, I'm thinking, you know, like, what is my dinosaur? Like, who's my dinosaur? Like a Tyrannosaurus Rex with, like, ADD? Like, uh, I don't know. Um, so, uh, years later, a friend of mine is an uh, HR director at Johnson & Johnson. And uh, she's like, you have all these interesting stuff. She's like, she goes, do you know, like, what your, your strengths, your career strengths are? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, chaos and information? I, I don't know, computers? She's like, you got to read this book called Strengths Finders. I'm like, really? She's like, yeah. You don't have to read it. You can just go buy this book and you take this test. It's about like, you know, 75, 80 questions. It asks you all these really strange, you know, questions where you really can't choose, like, you know, not applicable. We gotta choose one way or the other. And you retake this test and it makes no sense, you know, as to you know what it's gonna come up with. So I'm taking this whole thing, finally it prints out, you know, they send you the emails, you can log in, and wouldn't you know it, my number one strength, learning. Number two strength, ideation, ideas. Number three strength, communication, being able to talk. Uh, one of the other strengths was, uh, was woo, being able to like talk to people and like kind of promote like my, my ideas to other people, which I look at like, why are we kind of doing that? Computers, you know, with learning how things work and, and problem solving and then, you know, convincing someone else that this is what's wrong with the network. So. Uh, I highly encourage everyone, if you've never heard of this book, to go buy it. It's probably about $20. Uh, you just take a test, it tells you your strengths, and it's just absolutely phenomenal. I can't recommend this more. And you will learn, I encourage every other people to do this, because you'll learn more about your coworkers and what makes them tick. Um, and there was a, uh, a guy at, at uh, Comcast, and he was like one of those bulldogs on a conference call, where it's like he just would not let the problem go. He's so annoying, you know, it's like, is this, you can't let this problem go. And I finally, like, told him he's got to take this test. You know what his number one strength was? Restoration. That's why he was like that. Um, so, uh, it's like you, once you understand, you know, what your strength, I realize I'm like, oh, I'm not just compensating from an ADD. This is my strength. I've been using my strengths all along. I never really knew it. Um, you know, so I encourage everyone to go buy this book, read it, learn your strengths. Um, you know, develop your strengths, you know, you know, know your dinosaur, you know, keep, you know, promoting your dinosaur. Um, you know, for the Step Brothers people out there, prestige worldwide. I mean, thank you very much.
Okay, uh, this is me. <clears throat> Basically, uh, 20 years ago, so I'm old now, I think. Um, what I was doing at the time was I was having alternative civilian service, so instead of going to the army, it means you do something for the community. And I was working for an um, institution that does uh, projects with kids, so they're building summer camps and all that kind of stuff, so I was basically their one truck driver gathering all the equipment and the stuff that we needed and everything, so I was basically the guy doing everything except sitting in the office. And at one point the, they decided to have a sort of gathering of all the people that come to these events they do, like with their parents and the kids, and a huge event. It's like the setup we had out there for the scavenger hunt dinner, like lots of tables and chairs and everything. And they were doing it in a room that had hard wooden floor, really expensive ones. So it was, uh, well, the, the stuff they wanted to put there, the chairs and the tables, they had really sharp metal edges. So they said, mm, if we put that on there, we have scratches like you wouldn't believe and that will get really expensive. So let's have Jasper just use some duct tape <laughs> and well, wrap them so it doesn't scratch the floor. So what I did is I drove to the huge storage facility that we had for all the stuff that we use. And I spent, I think, at least six hours of wrapping duct tape around the legs of chairs and tables. <laughs> and at some point, um, I got a call on my cell phone that was 1993, so it was this huge thing, like a battery you wouldn't believe, and really heavy to carry around, but it was the first one available at all. So they called me like, where are you? What are you doing? You're supposed to be back like four hours ago. I said, really? Because I'm just doing this really carefully, like wrapping everything like it's supposed to be. I mean, I'm German, so I have to make sure it works right. <laughs> <laughs> so in the end, um, when we finally had the event, there were no scratches at all because I had wrapped so much duct tape around all those stuffs that nothing bad happened. And when I quit my service, when I was done, one of my, or my direct boss, he was doing these uh, drawings for me. I have a whole folder full of them. For everything that I did for them, he found some funny stuff. And what it says at the top is, Super J is getting things done reliably and fast, but the ST of the fast is not there. So it's like, I f fell asleep while doing it reliably. <laughs> So that is the joke that I um, got in this uh, thing, and there was another text below this, like, if you're working for us, you need to find your free spaces, otherwise you're going crazy. <laughs> so basically that's it, that is what I got from them for being, well, thorough. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. I am Mark Richmond. I am, like every one of you, a next generation developer. Uh, I may have been doing it longer than many of you, not as long as some, uh, but again, like all of you, I am a next generation developer. I've been doing it a long time. My oldest daughter is almost 40. That's the next generation I'm talking about, you see. I, I've had an influence in the lives of children as have all of you, parents or grandparents, or just people they meet, you have an influence in the lives of children. I was involved in K-12 education for about 15 years. I've been involved in daycare centers and, and uh, children's uh, infant daycare for 35 years. I've known well over 2,000 preschoolers, and if that doesn't scare you, it ought to. <laughs> In all of those interactions, I've learned one thing overwhelmingly in every imaginable way. There is a universal truth. Words matter. Words matter. The words that kids hear across the breakfast table, in the store, in their interactions with other people, yelled from the bleachers at the soccer game. 
Words matter overwhelmingly. I heard an article on NPR two days ago that our memories, our lasting memories, tend to not form, or the ones we remember, until we're about three or four years old. The rapid development of the brain between the ages of four and five appears to be responsible for that. It turns out that as you're growing synapses, they overwrite and reduce your memories of previous events. But once that development stops, those memories start to stick. Now, I know, again, from all these preschoolers, the person you are going to be is very often very apparent in a two-year-old. And if that doesn't scare your parents to death, it ought to. <laughs> but beyond that, the memories that we remember, the things that shape us, the things that influence us as adults and for the rest of our lives, begin about the time we begin to recognize language and retain those memories. And those are the things that stick with you. One of my own earliest memories, I was just over three years old. It was uh, winter time. My parents had company over for the evening. It was snowing heavily outside. And my mom told them, you should just stay here tonight. And they said, well, you don't have room. She says, oh, you can use Mark's room. He can lock his knees and sleep over in the corner standing up. <laughs> like a horse. I was so impressed. I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> Hell, I probably didn't know what a horse was, but I was something special. I could sleep standing up. I learned a lot of things about myself from adults. I learned that I was smart. I learned that I was good at math. I learned that I was a good reader. I learned that I was a good singer. What do they know? But. The things that I learned about myself from others early on, and this is early on, this is before you learn that people lie to you. The things I learned about myself from others shaped me as a person. They define, in large part, in the beginning and ever since, who I am, who I became. And that's true for everyone. We believe what is told about us, what we hear about us from others. People have influence in our lives. My son, when he was three years old, uh, was in a crowd of people and somebody, he used the word incredible. And he said, well, yes, I have an excellent vocabulary. He was three years old. His son, who was seven, has the same thing. It's amazing. That is why, I don't know who told him that, but he heard it from somebody. That is why it crushes my spirit to know when I'm in a fine retail establishment like Nordstrom's, or Macy's or Dollar General. And I hear parents talking to their kids and say, come on, slow poke. Or get away from that, stupid. You think those kids are gonna grow up to be AP biology students or Olympic sprinters? I don't think so. Words matter. So you, all of you who aspire to be next generation developers, congratulations, you are. Use that power wisely, please. Choose your words. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Jeff. Hard acts to follow today. It's just interesting information. Who else does scuba diving? It's fun, we've already had, heard a little bit. Uh, one of the pinnacles in some divers, um, I guess I'd say diving dreams would be to go dive the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And I was able to accomplish that last year. It was actually the second attempt. The first attempt I had to uh, cancel at 48 hours before departure because of medical reasons. And I figured that was it, I'd never get another shot. But that's okay, you just kind of deal with it, go with life. And I got another opportunity and so I spent seven days on a boat with uh, 18 other divers and a, a crew of about 10. And every day was basically more time underwater, it seemed like, than above the water, which is kind of hard to think about. Most of the time you do diving, you do a little bit of time, 30, 45, 60 minutes, and you're done for the day. Maybe you get to do it twice. And this was four to five dives a day. It's like, wake up, eat, go diving, come back up, eat break, go diving, come back up, eat, break, eat, you get the pattern. But the most interesting part was 
I was looking for that, that Jacques Cousteau or the National Geographic type um, underwater scenes that I had grown up with. I didn't start diving until eight years ago, so I was kind of late in life into it. But I was looking for that. I was expecting that. I didn't exactly get that. It, it was similar, uh, and it was also even more different in, in a lot of ways. Uh, related to our, our theme of sharks, there was one morning that they had a, a, a shark feeding. And they found this particular reef area that this dive boat uses that's got a, a circular, uh, almost amphitheater looking feel to it, and then a rock pinnacle that sits out in front. So all these scuba divers get inside this, this rounded, hollow area. They got this rock pinnacle out here, and they basically pull down a cage, and the sharks come down and eat all the different food that's off of it. The most interesting thing is the where I was and where the sharks were, were about to this fifth row. And they tell you, don't move. <laughs> now there's a reason for the don't move. It's not that the shark is gonna go after you. It's just there's just all this feeding frenzy. And the most interesting part about it was is that there were the fishes from the 15 foot long down to the you know one inch. Everybody got to eat that day. Right, because whatever the sharks aren't getting, there's a next size fish down, and the next size fish down. Uh, some of those fish might have inadvertently got in the way of somebody else's mouth. You know? <laughs> but that's what they say, don't get out in the middle of that because you're just going to get injured. And it's not you're going to be attacked, per se. You're just going to get in the middle of it. But the entire bits of, of being underwater uh, accomplished a number of things. One, it's really, really quiet underwater and I'm hard of hearing to begin with so it gets even quieter for me unless there are the different kinds of critters that do make noise like whales and we were actually at the edge of the whale season or when the whales come up from the Antarctica uh, where we were and we got to see a couple of whales one day and, and that was fun and I actually can hear the whales but it's very very quiet underwater and you have swim around all these groupings of fish and you've probably seen them in the movies even in the cartoons where you know the whole group of fish just takes off in a different direction and you can swim through and around these fish and they just basically go you're bigger and they'll swim out of your way and but you wonder about the communications how do they all communicate right it's the lead fish whoever the lead fish was and everybody follows the lead fish and it's interesting to kind of being underwater, relating about life, and then even think about well, what's going on above the water. And it takes me about another half second to think, who cares? Because I'm in this, <laughs> I'm in this different world. It's completely non-technical. I have two things in my life that are completely non-technical, and scuba diving is one of them. Uh, yet I have a dive computer. You know, I have all kinds of other technical things that I deal with. But it's that relaxation. It's not playing with packets but it's still seeing how there is an order, there is um, certain things that occur, and it's relaxation. And sometimes you just have to relax. So there it is, Diving the Great Barrier Reef. So my dad was uh, an Air Force officer, and so every three years, like clockwork, we moved around him. The country and around the world and um, probably the most interesting stint for me was the three years we spent uh, in Clark Air Base in the Philippines and uh, 1982 was the beginning of the you know the, the PC era at least for me and for I think for a lot of people and you know one you know one summer my dad came back from a, a trip to stateside and came home with an Atari 800 and that was just like gold for me. You know, I put that thing together with an Atari 810 disk drive, you know, five and a quarter inch floppies. Thank you for, for all that, Megumi. And, you know, I, it was, it's like my eyes were opened. But the interesting thing was that we would go to these computer meetings. You know, my dad found out about this, you know, Clark Air Base, I think is the third largest base in the world at the time. A lot of GIs, a lot of guys, they're single guys, what are they going to do with their time? So some of them did, you know, a whole bunch of things I can't talk about. A lot of them did things with computers. And so there was this computer meetup group. Once a week, guys come together. My dad took me to this thing, and we'd bring the entire computer gear set up, you know, set up the 800, set up a monitor, you know, big bolty screen at the time, disk drive, and then we'd just sit there, and we would 
all night long for two, three hours, we would back up, right? We'd be backing up software. And, <laughs> it's a, my, new, my new term. <laughs> and, you know, no copyright laws, so picking up software, I had no idea what this stuff did, right? And it, it's interesting to hear you talk about this because, yeah, we would get these, you know, on one floppy, they would erase pretty much everything, put, put the smallest bootloader on there possible that would simply put up a menu system with whatever problems they, or programs they could stuff onto that floppy disk. So sometimes it was two or three programs, sometimes it was 15 programs. It would be a little menu system, right? So you'd pick, oh, I'm going to try program number three. So for two to three hours a week, we'd go and copy, who has this number 47? And who's got 153? Oh, I'm looking for this program. Anybody have this program? I didn't know what these things were. So what manual? I didn't have any manuals. So I had all these games, I had all these programs. I'd boot them up and I'd, I'd stare at it. Some of them are obvious, right? Defender, Load Runner, Droll, these are games that are you know, you're basically walking around shooting things. But some of these more complex games, I remember one, one particular Japanese game, which you might help me with, I could never figure out what I was supposed to do. I was this square going around the screen, picking up other geometric objects, and I just, you know, I'd come back to it and never, and never make any progress. But, uh, you know, what I got from that was, you just try things. Right? Sit at the keyboard, you know, I'd be running around, I'd come up to something, I'd come up to a door, hit A, hit B, hit 2, hit 3, shift this, what does it do? And sometimes I'd make four progress. And, you know, that carried on to things that were not gamed. Word perfect, right? Word perfect back in the days before WYSIWYG, where bold was red and italics was green on the screen. And, you know, trying to figure out what could I do with this thing, and that's carried forward to today, where the manual was kind of like the last place I'd go. I, you know, the documentation is incomplete. It doesn't, you know, not everything's documented. You can do a lot more with programming and software that's not in the manual, so just give it a try. But it does backfire. So this, back in, I think this was probably late 90s, Windows 95 running on a, you know, powerful 25 megahertz processor, working on, you know, a term paper for college and sitting at, at you know, Microsoft Word, and I, I accidentally hit shift delete, and it deleted the word in front of the character. And I was like, oh, shift delete. I never did that before. What does alt delete do? Oh, that's pretty cool. How about control alt? <laughs> Thank you. Just to set everybody's expectations, I was informed that I'd be speaking last night. So um, I, I think the proper term for a lot of the content of this is ex post recto. Uh, and, but, um, uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get to the, the title eventually, but uh, um, when I was in college, uh, you know, I went to engineering school initially, uh, and then you know, didn't do well, so I went to computer science, because <laughs> Can't make it as an engineer. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, but I went to you know, went to school and uh, you know, I got to the dorm and a bunch of people I was you know in the dorm with were, were juggling and so I thought well that looks interesting and so I learned to juggle and, and you know, I ended up making my own bean bags and all this other stuff and you know and, and I met you know friends that I have to this day and uh, it was a great experience and but I I learned quite a few things from this and. Um, you know, and, and so I thought I'd talk about that today. And probably the first thing that I learned was that if you want to be extraordinary, you can't be ordinary. Um, and what I mean by that is um, the people I hang around with were really weird. That's what I mean. But uh, <laughs> no, for some reason in the Midwest, if you were at an engineering school, you know, they had like a math department with really smart and interesting and weird people. And typically within that math department or physics department, there were jugglers. I mean, just for whatever reason, you know, we'd go to these conventions and it'd be all, you know, all, all physics and math students and engineering students that, you know, doing this juggling thing. I don't know how that came about, but it, it just kind of materialized that way. Um, the, one of the other things I learned was that, you know, um, as I got better, we started juggling and making money on the side, just you know, for spending money at school. And you know, I, 
what little I know about working a crowd, I kind of you know started learning by doing this. And uh, um, you know, a couple of things I learned were that you know it, you, you can study this you know field field of study and field of endeavor and, and get very technically proficient. And there are things that you can do that take a lot of time and practice and talent to, to develop, and the crowd doesn't care about it. They care about the stupid things in a lot of ways. Um, like, uh, there's a juggling move called Mill's Mess, which is very technically difficult, and only other jugglers care about it. And, and it's the same in other fields, like in music, and, and, and brewing, and wine, and, and other things. You know, the, where a novice will appreciate something at one level, and an expert will appreciate it at a very different level. And, you know, that, that's another lesson that I learned. Um, let's see. Um, uh, uh, how much time do I have? Okay. I also learned that if you want to engage a crowd, a really good question to ask them is who wants to see something dangerous and stupid? <laughs> But uh, uh, the, the most important lesson I learned, and, and the one that I'll close with, is that um, you, you have to be on the lookout for opportunities and, and be on the lookout for good things that are headed your way. And I, I say this because one semester, it was the first day back to class, and I went up to campus to join my friends who were juggling. And um, you know, I was getting, you know, set my gear down, I was getting ready to juggle and, and practicing and stuff. And then my friend, Bill, who is a great friend of this day, uh, he, you know, said, Jerome, I'd like to, to meet Karen. And I saw this beautiful woman, and I knew right then that I, this is the girl I'm going to marry. And um, so, yeah, I met my wife, my wife juggling. But, uh, um, but, but like I said, you, you, you know, you always have good things coming your way. You have to keep, um, be on the lookout for, 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 for those things. And, and, and be able to recognize them and, and act on them. And, uh, and I think that's where I'm going to leave off. Uh, no, no, no. Um, fine, I'm going to juggle. They bought some hacky sacks, so I'm going to juggle. Uh, now, I, I will I'll preface this by saying I haven't done this in front of a crowd for decades, so... <laughs> is how to recover gracefully from drops. <laughs> <laughs>